We're going to be all right. Right. Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Otter Talk, Origins and Evolutions. My name's Pete Montford. I'm the artist and director of Otter Producers. Uh, for those of you who haven't seen any of our shows, we make uh, interactive outdoor work that we tour around, puzzles and games, we tour around street theatre shows and music events all over the country. Underpinning all of this work, there's a narrative that ties all of the shows together that's never publicly been revealed. Uh, I'm now 30. I first found the Otter 15 years ago, so we figured, as I spent now half my life with the Otter, there's no better time than now to finally reveal the hidden story behind the Otter. Oh. Right. So it all started uh, 15 years ago in my top 10 books. These are the sketchbooks here. In my history lessons, uh, we used to draw all over our books. We created worlds. Rich and I worked on the worlds together, creating fictions and stories, writing up, uh, just making a mess all over our books, basically. And on the back of this book was the otter. And this orator we just fell in love with. He was our favorite character. We used to laugh, play with his, play with his face, make jokes, tell stories. And eventually, our history teacher got fed up of us making a mess of our books. So he decided to give us a brand new one to create all of our jargon and rubbish in. Rubbish. So we started working in this book, and it wasn't long before we realized something was amiss. We turned to the back of our book, and on the back we found the otter had been replaced by the rhino. We were devastated. We didn't know what to do. We were lost without our otter friends, so we made a memorial page to commemorate his memory. The memorial page, we made loads of loving notes to our otter, got our friends and comrades to write for us as well, so we could all express our love and loss now the otter had gone. So we continued our lives, filled up this sketchbook, moved on to our next one. On the back was the rhino again. But one day, in the local newspaper, We discovered the otter had returned. We couldn't believe it. We'd lost the otter and now he'd come back to us in a local newspaper. So we, uh, we made a page for him to dedicate to the otter. We drew up presents and messages to him again from us and from our friends at school to celebrate the return of the otter. Obviously we didn't know the significance of this creature at the time. So we just continued on with our lives. And eventually the otter kind of faded out and he wasn't such an important character for us anymore. All of a sudden, we announced his retirement. Having not seen Otter for a number of years, we presumed him retired and out of work. Uh, so we had, we'd, we'd lost the Otter, he had retired, and then all of a sudden he came back to us twice, not once, but twice in the papers this time. So we celebrated once again, we were pleased to have him back in our lives. But still, a lot of things are written in newspapers, right? So it wasn't a huge deal. Uh, we continued on knowing that the otter was with us, but he wasn't still yet the significant otter that he was yet to be. Years passed, moved on to our sixth top 10 book. The otter wasn't with us. I went on a family holiday to Australia. And while there, I bought myself a Sponge Your Squarepants magazine, as you do. I loved it, wrote it, read it front to back, Turning over the last page, what did I discover? Phil. <laughs> the Otter returned. On the back of the magazine, it was made by Otter Press. So I'd lost it three times, and he'd come back to me three times, and this time on the other side of the world. What was the chances that I'd pick up that magazine at that, in that country and find the Otter returned back to me once again? So from then on, I'd found my quest. I took on the Otter as myself and I decided to explore who, what, and why the otter had come to me. So, what is otter? This is the big philosophical question that I'm still searching for now. 15 years on, I've made some conclusions, but the true essence of the otter I'm still yet to discover, and I may never find out really what he is. But while, while continuing and journeying on my quest, I still continued making art, in my sketchbooks. And it was during this time that I developed my black and white interactive hypnotic style that I later used when Otter came into, into real life. 
So I'll just show you some examples of the books. Uh, you might see some of these pictures up on the walls around you, so if you want to have a closer look later on, they are there. I started off with just doodles, and they kind of grew from little drawings on the side of the page to whole complete drawings. I have got some of the books, well, I've got all of my top ten books here at the front. So after the talk, if anyone wants to come and have a little browse, you'd be more than welcome. But I've got to warn you, there's some fairly crude and rude images in there. It came from a mind of a 15-year-old, so forgive that. It does mature as it, as it, as it goes. Um, so we've got another picture here. Uh, and I've always, uh, always liked art, obviously. And uh, I've always wanted art to be a little bit more than just looking at an image. I wanted to be able to participate in it as well. So these drawings that I made, wherever I could, I hid words and symbols within them for people to find. And this one in particular has a word that I'm going to ask if anybody can uh, find for me. Some of you might know what it is already. Uh, let's have the next slide. Zoomed in a little bit now. It should be, get, it should be pretty obvious. Any, any clues? No, it's, it's not otter. We'll have one more. Can you see it now? In the, neg in the negative space. Oh, yeah. There we go. <laughs> so, so this was, um, again, it came from a young mind, but it was my kind of screw you to the art elite. That when someone bought my pictures and have it looking on their wall, that they wouldn't know that there was a penis staring right back at them. Uh, yep. So this, this, uh, this picture definitely is up on the wall somewhere. And this is the, my ultimate dedication to Otter that I created in my very last top 10 book. Uh, it has the full story of Otter down the left-hand side. So obviously Otter in the negative spacing. Uh, but hidden in all of the squares, there's hundreds of images and symbols that are hidden within the picture. So I'll have a little look later on. So uh, I went on when I was 18 to go to university, studied in Reading, studying art and philosophy. And throughout these years, I continued on with my search for the meaning of Otter. And it took me on a journey through both metaphysical and actual reality. Uh, through art and philosophy, I learned lots of new theories to try and apply to Otter, to try and work out exactly what this thing was. He, when he first came to me, he started out as I believed him to be some kind of external being, something that had come to me, and some kind of guardian angel that was looking over me and drawing me towards happiness or enlightenment. Shortly after, he became a bit more abstract, and he developed into happiness itself, and he was the ideal that I was, I was working towards. Started taking on a fairly religious tone, as you might see there. The definition moved on, and Otter became perfection instead. It was the art, it was something that I was aiming towards. It became a platonic ideal, something that existed outside of our reality, something that, that is far greater and uh, not understandable within our own reality. But every time I thought I, uh, I had uh, grasped my conceptual antagonist, he managed to slip away and I had to redefine him again. Back in the real world, I confirmed my dedication to Otter and everything that he was by changing my name. So I went to Pete Otter Montford and I also tattooed him onto my face. But obviously that's hidden, so that's a little game for people. And I also went on a four-day otter detective course to try and discover more about the animals themselves. Uh, it was an interesting time. It was certainly something pertinent about otter behavior that struck a chord with the way that I create and produce my art and what my art is. I also explored mythological stories for otters to see whether there was anything in the history of otters that could try and enlighten me towards what this thing was. Uh, I found that it was, it was regularly cited to be a shapeshifter and would change its, its, uh, change its form to fit in with its surroundings, which again seemed to work with who my otter was. And there was also other stories that seemed to have some special significance. So while at university obviously I was studying art and my teachers encouraged me to go big and take my work out of my sketchbook. So this was my first attempt at that, the black and white of future. Uh, the title was something of an omen to come. But this is the first time that the black and white creature that we all know now first appeared, although he wasn't Otter then. He was only a prototype. Uh, but this was the very first and last representation of Otter as a religion. 
uh, continued exploring Otter and exploring next whether Otter could be uh, experienced by others. This time RETO, the Religious Experiments Theoretical Organization. This was a, a magical occurrence that happened in the art department with the tape exploding magically in the middle of the room and leaving messages all over the wall. On the back of the wall here, it said, uh, extends non-mediocre life. And you can see on the other picture there, Otter signed it. Uh, my lofty aims of getting other to people to experience Otter probably weren't achieved, but it signaled a uh, move in my art uh, to start exploring the boundaries between reality and fiction. So I went on then to explore that boundary in a number of different shows. Otter himself wasn't a large part of this. I continued on with my philosophy with, with Otter, but within my art, I instead tried to work out where the difference was between the real and unreal. Otter had made it not very clear to me anymore, so I hoped art would be able to provide me with an answer. But returning to my Otter, as I said, the philosophy I continued exploring, and I drew some interesting ties between uh, Sartre, Jean de Bord, Guy de Bord, sorry, from the Situationists, uh, Boudria and Deleuze and Guattari. I'm going to try and briefly outline the thoughts that I had around these, but I won't go too deep into the philosophy of it all. So Nietzsche declared God dead in 1882, which left humans with no universals to be able to dictate life. Sartre expanded this and said that humans have complete freedom, but with this freedom, it comes at a cost. We have a full responsibility for our own actions, but not only that, we also have responsibility for all of humanity. The Situationists utilized this freedom to try and take down the state. Guy Debord's book, Society of the Spectacle, he talked about how capitalism, capitalism had replaced reality with false representations to blind the masses. The Situationists created games and situations to try and break down these representations. Boudria brought the spectacles up to date, uh, but swapped the Situationists' images and commodities with signs and meanings. But the two that had very similar ideals. And finally, brings us on to Deleuze and Guattari and their theory of the simulacrum. Simulacrum is a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy until the final copy no longer represents the original anymore. And Deleuze and Guattari, unlike the others, offered us a way out, an escape through art. They demanded a positive simulation of the highest degree marshalling all our powers of the false towards shattering the grid of representation once and for all. And now this is where Otter steps in. Thanks to these philosophies that I looked at, I started coming to some conclusions about my Otter and who he was and what it meant to me. Uh, I realized that probably the Otter was just a dream and that it was just a fiction that I made up myself. Through the coincidences that I had when I was younger, I grasped hold of him and took him on, and once I'd had him, I was going to see him everywhere else in my life. I wasn't going to find Otter anymore in my quest, because now he was part of me, the chance occurrences couldn't happen, or so I hoped or thought. But Otter was real, regardless of his true nature. He was bound to be by my faith. I'd explored him in such length and breadth that Otter had become real, and he affected my decisions as much as anything else in the world did. He was as real to me as God is to a religious person. It didn't matter what his true essence was anymore. And to mark this philosophical realization, I created the Fictionalists, which was a fictional underground political party who were created a manifesto, and they were fighting for adding fiction to life in order to better society. A quote from the manifesto to give an idea of what they were saying, Art can provide an exemplary process of thinking for humanity, and the positive benefits of a creative mind are limitless. This is not to say that one must be an outstanding painter, poet, or musician to be able to enjoy life. Rather, it is the mindset and philosophy of creation that is important and not the actions. We see no reason why every day should be tirelessly dull and monotonous. A creative imagination is humanity's way out of monotony and mediocrity. So this show saw a turning point in my relationship with Otter. Having come to the realization that Otter was a fiction that I created, 
I now had the freedom to be able to absorb even more of Otter and start dictating how it was experienced by others. Pete Montford, the art making machine, brought Otter into real life. It was a real life representation of the relationship that Pete and Otter had had all along. Previously, Pete had attributed Otter to all of his work that he created. Otter was all of his artwork. But perhaps Otter had been in control all along and using Pete as a vehicle to move his desires. This was Otter's chance. He'd been made real, brought into real life, and Pete was stuck inside the machine, pumping out the, the artworks that Otter was demanding from him, and Otter was giving them out to the audience. So Otter controlled Pete, and he controlled the show, and it turns out he enjoyed this experience. Otter's second outing was with the Five Trials of Otter, which was at the, the Butler Pub on the What the Butler Saw in 2010. Uh, players were asked to meet Otter inside a room, a one-on-one -on -one situation where Otter gave them their first riddle to go off and find the first trial. There was five trials to complete, and each one, once it was completed, led them on to the next. Finally, people completed all the trials, and they were brought back to Otter to receive their prize. While everyone was completing the tasks and playing the games, all of the data was being fed back into Otter so he could keep his eye on who was where, doing what where. So once again, Otter was in full control, and Pete was nowhere to be seen. But the audience didn't mind. They loved Otter. Pete reappeared a few months later for a brief and bizarre art experiment called an in intentional recreation of an accidental encounter. In this show, it was this piece is Pete's attempt in trying to regain control over his Otter character who seemed to have just run amok. He was trying to make Otter see from his point of view. So the point of this piece was for Otter to present it, and he was going to try and recreate the initial chance encounters that Pete had had with Otter, but Otter was going to do it for Pete. Uh, this never happened, unfortunately. Neither Luck nor Otter was on Pete's side that day. On the day itself, Pete was called up because Otter hadn't turned up. Despite all of Pete's Otter detective training, he couldn't find Otter anywhere. So he had to turn up and run the show himself. And not only that, Otter decided to turn up 10 minutes later and could cause chaos throughout the whole presentation, putting rocks on the slides, going off to the pub halfway through, calling out names while trying to present. Uh, the whole thing was a nightmare. The tension between Pete and Otter was very obvious by the end of it. Pete was certainly starting to wonder what kind of monster he'd created. So now, 2011, we come to the mechanical memory machine. This was Otter's triumph. He had put Pete inside the box and was touring all around the country with his show, presenting Pete as the, as the artwork. Otter was now in control running everything, and Pete was left in the background. Pete was now a half-man, half-machine, manipulated by Otter and tricked to get inside the box. Otter told him he'd be the star. His name would be in lights, everyone would come to see him, and they did, they came to see Pete, but that was all they ever saw of him now. Pete was stuck inside the box while Otter pranced around the outside with his power, soaking up the limelight and taking on all of the credit for the show. And this is the way it is now. Otter is in the driving seat. He's fed off Pete's creations and drawn strength from the reality that Pete gave him. He's now in the limelight that Pete so once foolishly desired. In 2013, Otter started his company, Otter Producers, to signify the official taking over of Pete's art. Pete Montford's name fades and Otter's glows. With the company came new team members. Ortet and Reto joined the mechanical memory machine. And Otter produces the company itself started growing with volunteers. Otter was starting to become significant in other people's lives. And he was starting to see the reward of bringing others into the fold. So in 2015, Otter Producers created a new show, The Hall of Optical Obstacles. A colorful show. 
And not only the colour, the host was a red and white striped character, Salco. The idea of the show was for audiences to come play the game and dodge the lasers, test, uh, testing their agility and wits as they tried to get through the corridor in the fastest time possible. The leaderboard at the end showed them where they came in the score for the whole day. So now Otter has a mental challenge with the mechanical memory machine and a physical challenge with the Hall of Optical Obstacles. It was hard to see exactly why Otter suddenly brought color into his work. Uh, it's always been hard to understand what Otter's doing in the moment. It's only in hindsight that things start to become clear. Otter had decided to put Pete's brain inside the Hall of Optical Obstacles, and that was running the electrical system for the whole game. That's a, a choice that Otter's going to learn to regret. But in this, with the separation that Pete's now got from the show and the hindsight that I've now gathered, you can start seeing what Otter's intentions really were. Otter wants more people. He's starting to use Pete Montford up. He's using up all his body parts and all of the different machines. And now he's looking for others. Between the mechanical memory machine and the Hall of Optical Obstacles, he has a way of being able to determine the strong and find them. I believe he's now starting to reach out into our world. The color is just as a disguise. The stripes are still there, but the color is him trying to fit in with our world. What is Salco? Is he an otter or something else? We're not sure yet. He's still an enigma, and we're yet to discover the true nature of Salco. Only time may tell. So what's next for Otter Producers? Well, the team's starting to create smaller games now. There's, uh, he's got, uh, Otter's got a lot of uh, new crew that he's joined. And uh, he's the, the smaller games, he's trying to get this crew together to um, get the new people to go out and take, uh, take, take Otter, uh, take the crew out. Uh, we've got the... Yes, probably about enough of you. Otter, what are you doing? You. What are you doing here, Otter? You shouldn't be here. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm terribly sorry, but we are going to have to draw these proceedings to a close. This man, not even Pete Montford. We'll see about that. Can I ask you to hold this for me just for a second?
apologise again for interrupting earlier in such an unconventional manner. But there was only one man who could really take this talk forward, and that's me. I'd like to introduce the newest member of Otter Producers, which is Pete Otter, who's here with us and will be available to answer questions after the show. So we are holding a surgery on the sofas just at the back there. He's waving. He's over there. Here we are. This is Pete Otter, the latest member. Say hello to him. Say goodbye to me. We'll both see you on Saturday. Thank you very much. Goodbye. Have a nice evening. Later. Uh, that, that is pretty much it, but uh, just if there is any questions, Pete Otter's here. If anyone needs any help, just, just give me an ask, and I'll see what I can do. Thank you very much for coming. <laughs>